Hello, I'm Steve Haddon and I'm here at a rugby league mecca, Bishop Park, Albert Bishop Park, the home of the mighty North's Devils. They've been playing here since 1971. Before that, they were across the way a bit at Oxenham Park. The club is steeped in history, on and off the field. Mighty servants and mighty players. They make up much of the wonderful stories in the 75 year history of the North's Devils entitled Stand Up and Cheer. Gee, there are some great stories. Spilling from the pages are names like Bob Bax, Bert Bishop, Babe Collins, Jack Reardon, Jack Stapleton, and my favourite, Billy Pearson. Let's take a trip down memory lane as we introduce, to commemorate 75 years of North's Devils history, some of the surviving captains. I went to 5'8 because I couldn't, couldn't get enough of the ball and I couldn't do anything. So uh, we, we suggested I go there and, uh, and sort of got the blokes coming around me and what and uh, we sort of clicked a bit. We had a good forward, uh, Nev Warburton leading the forwards at that stage and uh, he used to take the pressure off the backs and that sort of we all gelled together. Yeah well the, the reason I ended up playing for um, North Devils was um, I was signed by the Melbourne Storm when I was 17 which was in, in 2000 um, which meant I had to play for the North Devils in their at the time was their, their feeder club um, and so I moved over I grew up in Logan City obviously just down the road and um, ended up moving over to play in the under-19s team which was the Colts side at the time in 2001 um, where I met the likes of uh, Cooper Cronk, you know, Billy Slater, Jake Webster, uh, Clint Amos, all, all guys that would eventually, uh, well most, most of them played for the Melbourne Storm and then others you know, went on to play first grade at other clubs. And Baxi worked out that uh, it was better if he could have six forwards on the field that could play well and uh, he could win 40% of the ball. He was better off having six forwards than having a hooker that couldn't play and having 60% uh, of the ball. And I was pretty lucky. I went in and uh, I played hooker ever since then and went on and played for Brisbane and Queensland as hooker. So I was quite pleased with it, yeah. I was a happy hooker. <laughs> Bill's was probably the greatest player to ever play with Northern Suburbs as far as I'm concerned. I've seen a lot of players through the 50s and all that sort of stuff. Bill Pearson was the, was the hardest man I ever played with. I guess what I'm pleased to say is he's on my side. Yeah, there was a number of factors in, in that 1980 season that sort of led to, uh, to the victory, I guess, in the end. But uh, primarily we were a, an underestimated football team. We were under the radar all year and we probably didn't realise ourselves until, you know, the years that followed uh, some of the emerging talent that was in that footy team. It was a very young team. But if I had to name an X factor, uh, there would be two names and I think they gave us the edge in class and an attacking ability to, to win a grand final. It was Mark Graham, the uh, great Kiwi back rower who was named Kiwi Player of the Century and uh, Joey Kilroy who was an emerging junior North uh, Rugby League talent who came in uh, his rookie year and uh, you know, dominated from fullback. Oh, certainly um, when Tommy Bishop came to the club he was a great asset. He was fabulous for us young guys. Uh, certainly Daryl Brahman in the latter end of the 70s. Um, <clears throat> Glenn Harrison. Uh, Eric Lilly. Uh, Englishman Jeff Wraith. Jeff came out for a couple of years. Was a huge contrib contributor to, to Norths during those years. And probably Steve Farquhar from the Caxton Hotel. They were all good players and they all played quite a few first grade games. I think with the contact, probably not as hard, not as many players in tackles, but certainly, you know, the head highs, uh, tackles after the ball was 
and that it much more prevalent back then and a good thing it's uh, not a lot in the game at the moment. I always remember <coughs> the 75 final preliminary, preliminary final against Redcliffe. They absolutely annihilated Tom. They had a job to do on him and uh, they ended up beating us comfortably and they took Tommy basically out of the game. It's been a tremendous um, club for you know, breeding wonderful footballers and you know, guys that played a lot of representative football and um, that game was really special to be a part of, the centenary test. I actually got to captain that, that team. Um, we played at the SCG, which was a ground that um, you know, has a lot of um, history about it, particularly with rugby league. And um, you know, to play against the Kiwis there and have such a strong victory with, with guys that had played for the Norse um, was great. I think you know, Michael Crocker was there in that game, Israel Folau was there, um, you know, Greg Inglis. You know, I think the majority of that team was dominated by the Norse Devils players. And I remember Bob came into my office on Wednesday and we sat down in my office <coughs> and we looked at the Valley side which had just, just been announced and we went through it and he said to me, he said, look, he said, look at these wingers. He said, both of them, he said, they're only little blokes. And he said, and we've got Fonda and David Adams, two big fellows, strong, hard running with good fans. And he said, you know, if we can get them ball with a little bit of a break, even a one-on-one -on -one situation, these guys are going to score tries. And uh, what happened at the end of the day? We won the, won the match at the end of the... We won it fairly comfortably. I, I really forget the score, but I know we won it fairly comfortably. Uh, but Fonda scored a try, and, and it was set up by Peter Hall, who, who drew some outside backs in and, and moved the ball to Fonda, and Fonda scored in the corner. And it worked out just as Baxi predicted. He, he pushed off the winger and, and, and went into the corner, no trouble at all. And so, again, it was a, uh, another ploy of Baxi's that we attacked them uh, on the flanks when we got up into their quarter. Yeah, on, also on the back of that was a Super League war and a lot of um, the NRL clubs there had, um, had folded and joined together. So we we're probably fortunate enough to get a lot of players that had, had a bit of NRL experience and um, had come back into this competition. So uh, it was an advantage there for us. Um, and yeah, as you said, the competition was changing a lot. There was, um, we had the affiliation with Melbourne Storm, so we were getting players regularly back from them uh, each week and they uh, were very young and keen to be playing in that NRL so they were obviously keen to, to be playing their best when they came back and played with us as well. The hardest one was the 50-60 when Baxi came. We had to win about 11 of the next 12 games to make the quarter final and which we did and uh, and I thought that was the best ever we, you could do. It's come from nowhere virtually and all of a sudden he's got us up there. That was great. I think at the time Bob Bax was a, a key figure for me. I came down a box and Bob was my first uh, senior coach here at North in 78. And then, uh, you know, I was skipper from 79 when a lot of the senior players left. And uh, joined, uh, Graham Lowe joined the team in, in that year. And uh, you know he was uh, a, a great leader of, uh, of a young team for us as well, as a, an emerging coach. So both of those guys were influential for me. Well, I think we're going back to uh, our first skipper who was on uh, in Billy Pearson because uh, we're pretty lucky because with our sides, uh, our belief in each other was, was there and no one was sort of looked at as you're better than me or I'm better than you. Everyone did the right thing, but Billy sort of instilled us uh, in that uh, 60, 61, 62 season when he was there that uh, everyone's eating, you got out and did your best and of course Bax as a coach he was great and uh, he sort of instilled the same to us but as a player I'd say that uh, and respect the net as a captain when I took over as captain I looked up as Billy Pearson as the captain and uh, sort of how he handled it and that's the way I tried to handle myself the way he had done it as well. Actually you know when I, when I found out that um, I was to play at Norse Devils. Um, it was a bit of a surprise to my father um, because he actually played for the East Tigers uh, back in the 70s and we had a bit of a conversation. This is before I played um, for Norse and before I signed with Melbourne. We had a bit of a conversation um, sort of halfway through my under 17 season where um, I was sort of speaking to my dad about where I was going to play my senior football in, in Brisbane. 
you know, should I play at East Tigers where you played, Dad, or should I stay down in Logan and play for you know the local senior club there? And he said, oh, mate, you know, play wherever you want, but just don't play for Norse. Because back in my day, that was the team I hated. You know, we just, East and Norse just had a huge rivalry and I hated to play them, just don't play for them. I said, oh, okay, I won't play for the Devils. And then the funny thing happened was that I ended up, you know, signing with, with Melbourne, as I said before, and um, was speaking with uh, Mark Murray at the time, um, who was um, a scout for Melbourne. And um, we're talking to Anthony Griffin, who was another scout in, in Queensland and uh, um, who were working at Norse and, and we had the conversation of where I was going to play and they said, oh, we're going to play at the Norse Devils. I think my dad nearly fell off his chair, but... Yeah, no, well, coming from the country footy, I always had that bit of loyalty, so I um, had, the, had two years here and then played, was fortunate enough to play uh, with the, the South Queensland Crushers and then came back to Norse and, um, and basically have stayed here and been involved with the club up until 2010 coaching. So, uh, you know, I love the place. Um, I would still love to be, be involved as well, but, um, you know, family things have stopped that. But, you know, I, I just think it's a great, great place and it's good for the I love bringing the kids here for game days and just getting them to watch the local league. It's a great little atmosphere. Um, if it hadn't been for getting involved with Melbourne Storm and John Rebo, uh, the club wouldn't be here today. Um, they uh, supplied players and, uh, and also um, supplied um, financial backing for the club and uh, that's what basically saved the club. The, uh, you know, the period of the majority of the, of the the time that the, the 75 years that the book is about was uh, a BRL era uh, where we had some wonderful clubs and uh, wonderful Queensland Rugby League football and clubs like Valleys and Brothers and Western Suburbs uh, are no longer in the competition and Norths has survived and uh, you know it's, it's a wonderful rich history that the, the North story from 1933 to 2008 and uh, you know I think it's, uh, we've got a wonderful future. Um, you know, we're now a feeder system to the NRL uh, and the, the state competition is a, is a strong one and a very viable one. And uh, you know, North are looking forward to being uh, around for the next 75 years as, uh, in that state competition. I really hope that North continue to be successful. Um, it's been a huge part of, of um, my footballing career um, and, and me as a person, you know, it's, it's helped me become the person I, I am. Um, and I know we're talking about, you know, the, you know, the 75 years, I hope we're, in a long time, we're talking about 175 years. <laughs> you never know, you never know. Um, yeah, no, I've got, uh, I've got another four years with Melbourne, um, so we'll see how that goes first, but... I'm sure uh, there'll, there'll come a day when um, I can put the boots back I on and pull on. I'll pull on the Devils jersey again. No worries, Dad. Cheers. Man. Thank you. It was silent and dark when a blue and gold spark caught the eye of a groundsman one night. Well, the hour was late. He was locking the gate, and it gave him one hell of a fright. For the feeling condensed in a presence he sensed, like a spirit or ghost that he knew. And the smell of a pie was alive in the sky with a good dose of Denko rub too. The flags on the posts came alive with the ghosts and the turf was aglow with their spell. And then, stepping forth from a shed in the north, came the men that he knew oh so well. The team from his dream in the fog and the steam and the light of the moon stood abreast. They were different in style, yet they carried one smile and a devilish brand on their chest. They were tough as old nails, with the wind in their sails that rekindled the brilliance they shared. But their chemistry stirred when a whistle was heard and the roar of a crowd fairly blared. Jack stapled and caught and he fed his support. There was class in the way that he did. With a thump and a thud, it was Big Victor Rudd in the brunt of a barnstorming skid. A good metres were found before going to ground, then continued the regime of fear. The next 10 ton truck smashing one off the ruck was the kid from Kilkeven, Lloyd Weir. His courage immense as he drew the defence, then offloaded a gem of a seed to the mountain Mark Graham preparing to slay him, the Kiwi Colossus at speed. The best of his nation with pure inspiration, 
And that was the way that it went. The skillful incisions and brutal collisions. No place for the soft of intent. More magic than myth was the whiz Cameron Smith. A true revelation at nine. As with talent uncharted, he scooped and he darted, then beautifully kicked down the line and monstered the winger. His hit a humdinger. His back rowers followed in suit. They hunted in packs, namely Babe and the Axe, like assassins with bad guys to shoot. Defenders at random, they picked off in tandem, both mighty men in Marone. Collins from Grammars with tri-scoring glamours and Gilly with shoulders of stone. Another caboose and the ball jolted loose. The gentleman halfback was there and stapled and passed with an action so fast that the great coach stood up in his chair. From Bob Bax's flock, Billy Pearson took stock with a sidestep, the show and the go. And as you'd assumed, Henry Hegarty loomed with the whole town of Sherberg in tow. Pearson to Heggers, belief hardly beggars, the fullback was chiming inside. From the bloodline of Bates, Harry flew from the gates, then he looked for his wingman out wide. And have a guess who? With his comb in his shoe, and a golden persuasion to guide him. With his foot on the gasser, young Fonda Matassa, the ambulance revved up beside him. Ah, Fonda was flying, the cover complying, he sent it a kick on the arc, the crowd fever grew, and Albert rose too, neath the sign that proclaimed Bishop Park. Doug Duncan as well, he was cheering like hell, as Reardon was blessed with the bounce. Ah, oh, supremely exciting, the journos were riding, the lightning Liz Morian pounced, but the last tackler came from the left of the frame, and he threatened to spoil the whole show. So Jack looked to the right, and behold, what a sight. The Mustaka of old Smokin' Joe. Ah, oh, giddy up matey, just like 1980, the Harley was now in full cry. With no one to match him, they won't bloody catch him. Joe Kilroy, you beaut, scored the try. It was brilliantly raw, but the crowd wanted more. So then Baxi came good with some changes. But there was nothing too sassy from Big E and Massey. For hard work and he were no strangers. And Turtle ran out for a cameo bout. He was brave and as busy as ever. And in linking with Muppet, decided to up it for one final thrilling endeavor. Murray at half went the blind for a laugh. He sliced his way through with some cheek. The clock counted down there in old Banyo town. His pass found a genuine freak. Greg Inglis unplugged. Three defenders were mugged. With a fen then he sprinted away. And in crossing the line, it was hard to define but the colours all faded to grey. The atmosphere cleared, the crowd disappeared, and the fog and the darkness returned. Just the groundsman alone with the wind that had blown, though the pride of his vision still burned. And that's what remains in the rugby league veins of the men who have answered the call. Every player who played, every coast through the grade, every loyal supporter and all. From the Oxenham face to the modern day gaze, that exists without hint of a failure in a young devil's eye to be scoring that try for Norths, Queensland, maybe Australia. And sometimes at night when the feeling is right and the light of the moon shimmers forth, well, if you're around on this most sacred ground, you might see a spark in the North. For the story is true of the blue, gold and blue when those wonderful ghosts reappear in a glorious tide and with devilish pride, you too will stand up and cheer.